There's a presentation about abiotic variability in a microtidal regime, uh, raising the question whether or not irregular fluctuations result in stable succession trends or not. So to the contents, uh, general motivation, of course, then the concepts and history of this, and then the field case and own results followed by a synthesis and outlook. Uh, let's start with the motivation. Anthropogenic impacts as eutrophication have led to derogations of aquatic ecosystems worldwide, as you can see here. In fact, it's a big case because it's a, it's a lake where a large river runs through, and you have what the body would call a pristine state or what you like, some sulfides on their sand. And then there is a fish hatchery, and underneath the fish hatchery, you see already some derogations, and it's so you follow uh, eutrophication gradient in that case, and you see really the effects easily. Such things happen worldwide, and this has led, together with the increased demand of uh, for water and water-related resources, has caused major concerns, and consequently, almost in all countries uh, all over the world, regulations have been released to protect these water resources or water-related resources and to improve whatever you, you, you uh, imagine with this word, to improve the ecological status. I mean, that's complicated and I'll not discuss this issue. What's the improvement of an ecological status? Because ecology just works. But sometimes it doesn't work as we like. So this is something anthropogenic, this improvement. All of these regulations ask at least for a classification system. The simplest would be good versus bad one. And for this, you need some indicators. And phytoplankton in all of these systems is either as a bulk parameter, let's say chlorophyll A or turbidity or whatever, or at least to a rough taxonomic resolve, phytoplankton is part of most of these classifications. In the European Water Framework Directive, which is one of these classification systems, uh, it's one of the mandatory ones. So one of the few parameters which, has, which must be taken into account. And if you go to a classification, if you want to decide whether it's a good or not uh, status of the ecosystem, you need something like a reference. And this reference status describes you what you want to see, how it should look, this system. And uh, in the EU water framework, it's described as an undisturbed status of the ecosystem, which in most of the cases for Europe never existed because as the glaciers went back, population went into, uh, into the European ecosystem. So it's hard to imagine this reference status and in most of the cases, you can't observe them as a reference area. So you have to, to think about this, to extract, to analyze them. And this is the challenge, identification of long-term trends that by re-extrapolation, you get an idea how the system might have looked before a human impact disturbed them. So let's look for the tools for an example. This is Germany, and you have. This is the North Sea area where Denmark comes, and that's the Baltic Sea area. And the example area is the coast of the Baltic, which is the county of Mecklenburg Vorpommern, which is part of the former GDR. So here goes the uh, Polo Forest, so it's the eastern part of Germany. And these are the areas uh, which were studied by this. This is a map showing the water chemistry and phytoplankton sampling points. These all are long-term data. So they are only stations which have a record of more than 15 years sampling. And in most of the cases, it's monthly sampling, except for winter months in which there was ice cover. So then the sampling stops. So we have a pretty good database for this. 
And uh, for the study I'll present, I made a bit a uh, selection to get a uniform data set in that case because it covers just this coastal system. We are, uh, we are ending with about 3,000 data sets. And if you go through them, you will see a trend for this period. So, for example, the Unification, which dropped agriculture in the eastern part, so agricultural influence was decreased, etc. But have a closer look. The unification was in 1890, the same happened before. So it took us some time to realize that the change in the nitrate was before, and therefore I plot a salinity line. variability which caused the trend. And if you don't go deep enough in thinking, you may misinterpret this as a sign of the political change which changed agricultural practice, etc. But in that case, for sure, this was not the case. Another example, also physical factors show, uh, show the high variability. For example, lungs. In, in many cases, you have for example, decrease of macrophyte meadows, so it's related to humidity, to um, starvation by life, because not enough life comes through. But just like we have the other reason, the pronounced regularity of the life, it can be anticipated, so in winter time you have just 30% of the peak time in summer, uh, of the peak duration, which is in fact as we think for a lot of reasons, the yield of 265 day life cycles, which are in With it. This depends on the site, on the weather conditions, on the turbidity. And uh, yeah, going into the last step, on top of it, there is this large tailwind effect because of the surface roughness, which increase, which may increase tidefall, the surface intensity on top. So what is the light you are measuring if you are talking about phytoplankton? Okay. There's also uh, some chemical factors which change a lot. Sorry, I have no clicker, so I have to find. For example, something which is still a mystery for us, but which appears in our lab, which is the so-called ammonium rhythmicity. Um, here you have, a, uh, you have a little chart of such a full day measurement from time measurement of ammonium, and we have it always where we have clear weather conditions that peak of ammonium, we know where the ammonium goes to. It goes to the phytoplankton. It's taken up really within one hour completely, but we don't know where this pulse comes from. So we thought already about, okay, uh, zooplankton wakes up in the morning and then at noon they have eaten enough to go to the toilet, but we still don't know where it comes from. 
It's observed in all of these uh, Southern Baltic lagoons. So it's not just one example, but we don't know about this. And now think about the monitoring system that we have. So it depends from the time you are taking your sample, what is your ammonium value, how to relate this. And of course, we also have biotic factors which may disturb the system. We have in one of these areas, it's a national park of Germany, and there are about a million of Jesus and 20,000 swans as potential herbivores. Um, the surface of this area is about 100 hectares, and about 20% of the water surface is covered by macrophytes in good years, which means we have about 80 swans and 200 ducks per hectare. Not for the full time, it's a migratory resting area, so they come just for a limited time for about a week, and then they are gone. Altogether, the whole mi migration period may take about two weeks. Then the system is pretty hard hidden by these herbivores, and whether we get a macrophyte here or not depends from the timing. Whether these birds arrive before or after the carophyte development starts in this area. If they arrive before, so they are grazing in the terrestrial area. They, don't, they can't touch them because they are not yet here. And then we have a macrophyte here. But if the timing is a bit different that they come after the development has started, then we get a phytoplankton here. This has nothing to do with eutrophication or anthropogenic impact. That's just a matter of timing. It's even not climate dependent because we still don't know what is triggering their migration period. So let's go to an example. We have also a large hydrological variability which hampers the analysis at a certain station. Let's think you are at one of the stations, the Zinc station, for example. So you would first classify it according to their salinity. It's about that's the long-term mean of the salinity. But this has a huge year-to-year -year variation. So this is the change of the mean salinity for a period of about 20 years. If you go for the months, so it's even worse. And if you just take one year out, you have your seasonality and salinity, and you put it on a daily basis because we do these measurements in a five-minute rhythm, then you see that the plus minute between these different salinity classes can be passed within a day. So what shall you do? Or is this of any interest? Yes, it is, because we have a strong dependency of the bio volume from salinity, because this salinity gradient is caused by mixing of terrestrial runoff, which is highly eutrophic, with Baltic seawater. So if you would classify this station, it depends mainly on the number of high saline samples you have taken and low saline samples, whether this is eutrophite or mesotrophic one, which is not easy to deal with in a classification system. Anyway, nevertheless, we have, or it seems that we have a response. In 73, severe eutrophication at this part started, and um, as Peter Bachmann and Nagel have published, it seems that the number of or the percentage of colony bacteria declined in this time. The growth size increased in this time, and the full food network became disturbed. So this was the former situation, or the first observed one at the beginning of the 70s. And this is, at the 80s, the resulting um, in the mid-80s, the results to both phytoplankton and macrophytes decline, and also the connectivity in the system decline. Whereas sea plankton uh, consumes about 4% of the available biomass before this drops down to 0.25, which means most of the production of the primary production went into detritus directly. This was the conclusion. So the conclusion was the system has changed heavily. We believe this. We started to unravel how they came and 
why this isn't doing better in, uh, with respect to connectivity in the, in the food chain, etc. We did not find any response on diversity. And with respect to this, something very interesting <laughs> happened. We believed this, we investigated this, until we got these data. So this was the beginning of my PhD work, and I found such an all industry reference microscope um, in the institute, and together with Ms. Schumann, we installed it because she wanted to study this very small phytoplanktonic uh, cyanobacteria. And here we have from different states a decline in the percentage of cyanide exclusion biology over time until we import this. So what happens? Now we are back to old numbers. What happened? Was a change, but what kind of a change? It was not a change from cyanide bacteria to something else. It was a change inside cyanide bacteria from unity to a very small phytoplanktonic one instead of the former dominating large nitrogen fixing one. Because the system went hypertrophic, so there was even no nitrogen limitation anymore. Still a cyanobacteria dominated system, but it's another kind of cyanobacteria. But of course, this will also alter the pictures we have about the food web I've shown before, because we were not seeing them. This is one micron one micrometer, uh, these uh, picoplankton plankton ones, so you can't see them in an ordinary light microscope. So let's go a bit more into detail. If we go in these systems, you usually would see this composition of the phytoplankton dominated by cyanobacteria, followed by, these are the cyanobacteria, these are an example of these large ones with the heterocysts, able to fix nitrogen, followed by uh, some diatoms, then dinophytes, some chlorophytes, cryptophytes also play a role, I'll not talk about this, and the so-called others. So mainly cyanobacteria, you would say, okay, it's a nitrogen-limited system, but that's not completely true, because in wintertime, if I go for seasonality in wintertime, it's green algae dominated. In spring, we got, we still have this diatom bloom in spring, and only in summertime the system is nitrogen limited. So how can I say it's a nitrogen limited system? It's a nitrogen limited system in summer. I have to be more specific with this if dealing with this system. And this summer impression is just because we also have a biomass and the summer has the highest biomass, so if you average this for a whole year, then you get the first picture with this uh, cyanobacteria dominance. And if you think about the trigger for this, of course you would say it's light. And indeed, this is the, the, the radiance, and these bulbs just simplified. Indeed, it looks pretty good. Of course, you have a lag between maximum but that's biology, that these organisms need some time. So we were looking for light limitation, for light effects, for irradiance effects, chromatic adaptation, etc. for almost a decade. But let's come to the, to the last thing. So it seems we have now um, an idea about this and we have a problem. We know that huge vegetation increases biomass, but biomass varies in an annual cycle as well. How can we use biomass as an indicator if we have such a huge variability? Of course, if we know about the trigger for this biomass seasonality and its belief that it is irradiance, then we may relate this to the irradiance. Um, and eutrophication is believed to influence species composition. The EU Water Framework Directive asked us specifically for bioindicators, but species composition also changes in annual cycles. So how to, how to come out with a, with a set of indicators for the eutrophication status in this? So phytoplankton is responding very fast to many parameters, not only to eutrophication, 
So we have to look for indicative periods, for periods in which the phytoplankton is structured by the factor we are looking for. And an example for this will be given here. Uh, you all know that diatoms have such a shell made of silica oxide. So you would say that there should be a relation between silica concentration and the biovolume of diatoms obtained. If you do this, um, behind each point there is a 10 years data set and each point is representing another area. So if you do this for January, you don't get a good correlation. And I even don't talk about the standard deviation because they are much worse. Of course, because in January the system is frozen and no matter where the uh, what silica is available, it's it's not of interest for the, for the diatoms. They don't have any light in this period. They are in darkness. In February, it becomes interesting. Now, we have a better condition. It starts to improve, and you get a good correlation. In March, it's getting worse. That's too good to be published. I mean, no one would believe such a line, so we have to open even our database to get it published at the end. And in April, it vanishes. So if you would be interested in this relation between silica content and biovolume of diatoms, you have to increase these periods in March, not before, not later. And if we apply this to our system or to one of the systems, I just take one out because all the tables are transferred to this seminar. So the trigger thing that we have a about 75 years data set. Then we come to a seasonality, which is shown here. We have glyphosate is 500 phosphate uh, circles, and uh, these are the months. So after the breakup of the ice, bio, uh, biomass develops and consumes nitrogen and phosphorus, first in parallel, so the content of the source of nitrogen and the source of phosphorus increases. And at this point, something happens. By the plants, which gives you the residue ratio, the nitrogen over phosphate ratio. And if this works below 50, which is the 15 to 50 uh, requirement ratio, then phosphate really has any interest anymore. We still have a runoff, we still have phosphate released from the sediment, but this can't be used anymore because now we are stuck in a nitrogen limited period, in a period where these large giant bacteria get their chance so it seems the system is pretty well understood. We have first a period of energetic limitation, so we haven't enough light. This energetic limitation decreases in the course of the year, and then first nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, phosphorus becomes both more and more important for the system because the concentrations are declining, and passing the red field ratio, nitrogen takes over the system as the limiting factor. So this can be applied now if you are interested in eutrophication, then you have to look for this period where the availability of both eutrophication indicators are important to the spring period. And this has been done uh, by a postdoc of mine, Thorsten Rieling, who was concentrating on the spring period and indeed got a huge reduction in the coefficient of variation in the database. So this was the first sign, okay, if we look for the indicative period, if we uh, concentrate on these periods, we get better results out of the analysis. So at the end, we constructed uh, out, out of the set of potential indicators, phosphorus, glyphosate, chlorophyll, A, and Epitax, which were the most interesting after the analysis, uh, a so-called synthetic degradation index, which he was applying to our about 300 parameters we have available in the database. And, come on, sorry. And as you can see here, uh, already the iron value of F1 was pretty high and not completely, but almost equally um, respecting all these four factors. Actually, that was a bit under uh, underrepresented in the database. Pn, of course, has a really high number 
dominating already in some cases at the end of these spring period chosen. But altogether, it, it looked like we could use this synthetic degradation index. And we applied it, and out of the analysis, we got 14 parameters which were significantly correlated with this synthetic degradation index, which were then tested again for their sensitivity to temperature and salinity. And when we did so, we found out that some of the parameters are still dependent from salinity and temperature, which is not what we are targeting, and so we left them out, and had at the end uh, a set of parameters left, which we then used for a cluster analysis. This is uh, business as usual, and then we could define these ecological statecrafts out of the parameter borders of these clusters. Anyway, but let's come back to our assumption. Because here we were testing for salinity, which is understandable because salinity plays a major role. As I have shown, we have direct correlation between salinity and biomass or yield of the station. How did we test for temperature? Um, we tested for temperature because we were interested in macrophiles as well, where we had this balance between the migration period and uh, the effect on cytoplankton. So we had them still in the analysis for no other reason than curiosity. And sometimes it happens that you hit the wrong column by your, uh, by your analysis and decide a gradient which detects temperature. I did so by accident, yeah. of course, temperature lags behind irradiant. And this is much better correlation than we had for irradiant. And hey, we are talking about organism which is generation time of a couple of days at the outermost. And we have a lag of six weeks. We should have known before that something is strange with it. Now it looks much better. It's a pretty good correlation, a real fantastic correlation, so we couldn't ignore. So it seems that it is like this, light, as I told you, phosphate, nitrogen, but temperature seems to shape the system all over the year. How can this happen? I mean, we are talking about autotrophs, and the Q10 is different for respiration and photosynthesis. So we should expect something the other way around. Not that higher temperature is improving the phytoplankton. It is favoring respiration, not photosynthesis. And if we have this, we really have a problem. At the moment, we just have a hypothesis which we are testing by, by means of a grant of our government at the moment. We think it's trophic interaction rather than direct uh, factor. So first, we have a lot of nutrients but no energy. Then, if sun raises, uh, rises, the nutrients are converted into algal biomass, of course. Uh, using this resource, zooplankton develops a little later, and then it's feeding down the algal biomass. Not that much, because at the same time, it's also recycling nutrients, so algal biomass becomes reduced, but becomes also more productive. And then we have the plankton feeders, and we think it's this part, which is in the system all over the year. Of course, there is some replacement, etc. But these guys are least transition dependent. So they are triggered in their activity by the temperature itself. And if their grazing activity on the zooplankton increases, the system behaves like this. You may ask, of course, immediately about the predators which are feeding on the plankton feeders. But in the system we are investigating, you can almost forget about the predators because they are overage a lot. No one wants these guys with it, these plankton feeders. They are even thrown back if they are shot by the hunters. But perch and pike perch, uh, pike perch and pike, these are the predators we are talking about, and they are heavily overfished at the moment by sports angers as well as by commercial fishery. They are just interested in these two species, so we miss them at the moment as a fish net. But again, it's still a hypothesis. It's 
uh, it's tested just now. So we started this year and we expect the first uh, results at the end of this year and the program itself will run another two years to find out what happens here. Thank you for your attention.
Ich habe noch ein paar Questions, die das gerne abgeholt haben.